If you're in education, have you ever heard of this statement? The bell doesn't dismiss you. I dismiss you. Because honestly, um, if you said that, probably not the best day for you. Kids are bolting for the classroom and trying to get out of there as soon as possible because they're totally disengaged. And I will be the first one to admit I have said that or a variation of that in my teaching career. And it's not to kind of point out that that's a statement, that we're having a rough day. But where did that come from? Where did that come from? I didn't make it up. Probably you listening to this, you've either heard it or maybe even said it or both. And I think the reason I bring this up is because a lot of times in education, things are passed down through generation through generation. And we just do stuff because we've always done it, but we don't actually even question why. And that's why I really love talking to Superintendent Neil Young and not the musician Neil Young, if you're Canadian, but his name is Neil Young uh, from Lodi, California. I'm actually going to be speaking with a school district in July. And he talked about really kind of challenging some of the things that we do in education and just asking why, which is wonderful to hear from a superintendent because a lot of times we're concerned that uh, the people that are above us and the traditional hierarchy, they don't want us questioning that. But the ultimate is, is this working for kids? And if you're doing something in your process as a teacher, um, you know, as an administrator that worked hundreds of years ago for students, I think you should keep doing it um, if it works today. And on the other side of it, if you're doing new stuff just because it's new, but it doesn't work for kids, you shouldn't be doing that. Whatever works for students is what we should actually be focusing on. And sometimes we will just do stuff because we've always done it. And I think questioning that, asking why are we doing this and is this still helping our students is a really important question. It's something we talked about today. So I love talking with Neil. We had a great conversation about education before we talked about sports and music so you don't have to listen to it. But you're going to love this podcast. Uh, I learned a lot from Neil. But welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, this is George Kroos. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I have Superintendent Neil Young, not musician Neil Young, but Superintendent Neil Young from Lodi uh, Unified in California, which I will actually be joining uh, in July of 2024 uh, for their opening day. I honestly just am so excited just kind of hearing some of your philosophy of education, um, some of our common outside education interests. Just really excited to join your district. I know I've heard absolutely incredible things uh, about your community. So I'm, I, I always see it when I go into a community, I'm not there just to share my ideas, but to learn from you as well. Mm -hmm. And I steal stuff from districts all the time, right? So I see the amazing stuff. So I'm like really excited to learn from your staff. So um, everyone that doesn't know you, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do today, how you got there, I think it's a, a great place to start. Sure. Uh, Neil Young, I am uh, an educator. I've been in uh, public education since 1997 been in Lodi Unified School District as a teacher uh, since the 90s. Um, boy, that's aging myself, huh? Right. So the, ni the 19th yeah. century. <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> way back when we didn't have cell phone, uh, uh, we didn't have smartphones. No. Um, so starting education, um, I actually spent one year working with Corton Community Schools, but really I was a sixth grade teacher and um, I've worked in middle schools as an administrator. I have uh, run curriculum instruction programs throughout the district. I've worked in personnel for a time being. Um, that's the least creative place to work in a school district, but um, an important thing to learn. Um, I've worked, um, most recently, I actually left the district office. Um, this is kind of a unique story because a headhunter would say the best way to become a superintendent is not to walk away from district administration, but I did. Oh, wow. And um, I, I had this moment and this epiphany, which is I'm losing my heart for education and I'm putting my career pathway in front of the heart behind why I'm in education, which is about kids. So um, I jumped ship. I requested to run away from uh, the district office and uh, go back to an elementary school, uh, Woodbridge Elementary School. And it's actually the community in which I live, which is a really eclectic little community just north of, um, of Lodi proper, uh, but it's still part of our district. And um, 
I uh, spent five years uh, with that community. It's the only administrator. We had probably 350 to 375 mm -hmm. kids. I lived in there. I, I mean, I rode my bike around. I would hang out with people. I, I, I got to know the whole community and it was the best thing I ever did because it gave me perspective and district office perspective can be wrong and it can be based on assumptions and complaints. And then I got back to the school site and realized, wow, now I know what it feels like to be out in the trenches and hearing what I hear from the district office and what I, you know, preach from the district office, there's a disconnect. So um, I did that. And, um, and then I got uh, gobbled back up to move back to the district office. Yeah. And um, they appointed me as the assistant superintendent of elementary. And since that time, um, it has given me an opportunity to make those connections again between district office, school sites, and really influenced how I viewed uh, the role of a district office uh, for our school sites. And then eventually um, they appointed me as the future superintendent. And now I sit in the hot seat known as the uh, superintendent of Lodi Unified School District. We, we have about 27,000 kids in our district. That is, that is, okay. This is, I, so people have to know this. I don't actually have any questions for this one. I just kind of base it off what I hear. Now, <laughs> I guarantee you everyone's wondering this, like what changed for you when you, so now that you went back to a school from district office and then went back, what did you change in your practice? Like this is a, actually, that's an amazing story. And I'm like so fascinated by this now. Yeah, and I, I, I think it's a work in progress certainly, but I think there is a traditional way of looking at things, which is the people at the top give direction to people down below mm -hmm. and that people down below then do what the people up above tell them to do. It's kind of that um, traditional hierarchy mm -hmm. that um, you stay in your lane. You are this, you know, you're in the classroom. So take direction from the superintendent, from the principal and so on and so forth. I think what it did for me is gave me a perspective and I know whether or not some of your listeners are um, anti-military or not, you know, I don't know about, you know, where people are on that spectrum. It's a unique time in the world, but I think if the Pentagon spends all of its time requiring the, um, the troops out in the field, the ones who are working on the front lines hmm. to meet all the needs of the Pentagon, then that's how you lose the war because it's not what the district office needs. It's the opposite. We need to do everything in our power here to get out to the troops on the front lines. And those are our school sites, our teachers, mm -hmm. our paras, um, you know, our site administrators and give them what they need, support it and serve them instead of there, they are there to serve us. So I think that was probably the biggest transition for me is it took away the understanding from the district level and gave me a new insight into how we need to approach this work. So when I, when it was in, I don't know if you had this, I had, I struggled not doing my job when I went from, you know, school district or from a school principal to district office. I struggled with when I kind of, you know, felt I was losing my way in a day, I would get up and go be around kids. Yeah. And then when I was at central office, I'm like, I don't, I don't want to be around other adults. I want to, like, I miss the kids. Right. And then I started asking myself like, I, Hey, you know, I can, I, I have flexibility just like as a principal, I can go to these schools. So I remember, um, and it t totally backs up what you're saying. I would call school principals and say, Hey, I have to like knock off some paperwork. I got to do some email. Is there a teacher I could just sit in their classroom for the afternoon and just do it in the back of the room? So I could just kind of be there and they're like, Oh yeah, this teacher will love to have you in the room. So it wouldn't be like, I'd pop in for five minutes. I would just kind of park, uh, you know, with a laptop, sit there 
and I would clearly communicate this every time. I say like, hey, I'm like here just doing some of my own stuff. I understand this. I am not here to evaluate you. I'm here to actually evaluate the environment that we put you in and to make sure that you have what you need. And so if there's anything I can see. And I, I, I distinctly remember this one time there was a teacher who brought out like iPads for everybody. The kids were using it. And she gets up on a table because the Wi Fi is not working and stands up, like holds it up, like it's going to be struck by lightning with Wi Fi. Cause I, cause I, a lot of people have, I've done it. I'm not going to lie, where you kind of put your phone up, you're like, you yeah, think you do the aluminum foil hat where you're like, <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. And, and then, you know, all the kids are struggling to get on and she's doing everything she can to get this to work. So I'm sitting in there called our IT department, which, you know, I was in charge of. And I said, Hey, we actually have to ensure that this stuff works. So we need more, we need more, um, I can't even remember that, that, whatever. We need more access points in this room to make sure the Wi-Fi works. And I'll never forget. I'm like making this phone call right in front of her. And she just looked at me, she's like, right. Cause there's probably about a hundred times before she did the exact same thing, but it didn't work. And then we got it to work. And and if I wasn't there, I would have never known that because she probably wouldn't have said anything. She doesn't want to seem like she's complaining and stuff like that. So one of the things I'm really passionate about, and I say this all the time, that if you, and obviously you live this, if you make decisions for classrooms, you better be in the classrooms. Like you better see what's going on mm -hmm. because like you don't necessarily see the impact of some of those decisions. And I'm like, I'm not limiting. I'm talking politicians too, right? Like, I don't want to limit that. And I know, I don't know if you can say that because of your role, but I can't because <laughs> so I can do whatever I want. And so. No, I, I, right? I, yeah. I do believe an important part of being a board member is keeping a pulse. Yep. on what's going on and being present to see the ebb and the flow of the challenges and realities. I mean, I think one of the most difficult pieces for me, because I'm known in this community, mm -hmm. um, my wife and I've been here a long time when you've taught in a lot of places, been administrating a lot of places. I mean, it's, I don't get to hide and um, it's humbling because we are not where we need to get yet. We're seeing some great things mm -hmm. and um I'm reminded, it's funny, looking at your book, it's like, okay, don't focus on the negatives, right? Don't focus on the things yeah. that aren't going well all the time. Yeah. Um, I used to, the analogy I used in, uh, I was a high school girls volleyball coach for four years. And I used to tell the girls, all right, I'm going to tell you not to think about a green gorilla for a minute. And I'd ask them, so right. what are you thinking about right now? A green gorilla, you know, they roll their eyes. I say, so why do we keep pointing out all of our mistakes all the time? But for me personally, um, I know we have a ways to go because I still see that there's a mistrust that the words I'm saying, which are, we are here to serve. Yep. And the, the reality of that transition to being a district that is about servant leadership, support networks, and, um, you know, keeping the battle plan and the war in mind, which is for the minds of our children who will one day be the adults. And, um, mm -hmm. and so it, it's a humbling reality because as you say that, you know, I get bogged down with life and mm -hmm. important things, but it's, uh, it, it is easy to lose sight of why we're here. I mean, no kids, uh, we have no a system, no right. kids, no paychecks. They are the cornerstone of what we do. Love it. The, you know, the, uh, I, I would talk to you before I ran a marathon in January and mm -hmm. I was listening to, uh, Ryan Hall. He's a, one of the best U S marathon runners ever. Mm -hmm. And he said, like, you're going to always feel some pain during a race. Mm -hmm. The worst thing to do is focus on the pain because it won't get worse. He mm -hmm. said, focus like on a joyous moment. And it's actually interesting because not only does it get your mind off the pain, it actually gives you energy, which I, which really, really helped me because I am not Ryan Hall. Like, you know, he's doing it in, you know, half the time that I'm doing it. So I have a lot more time to dwell uh -huh. uh, on things, but that is, you know, I, I'm not, I hate focusing on, for example, anti-bullying because you're mm -hmm. putting bullying hit things into the heads of our kids, like cyberbullying negative, right? So I focus on leadership, right? Focus mm -hmm. not on don't do this, focus on here's what you can do to elevate. So I, I absolutely love that. Um, you, you know, you'd mentioned you've been in, in Lodi for, for a while. 
and you know you've you've seen it from very different roles and you started in the 90s mm-hmm. I, I barely made it. i was 99 so it was you know a little couple of years ahead of me um what have you seen as some of the transitions in the community like what have you seen as you know things because you know i saw something that was, i thought was really interesting there is this perception that you know education was the same way it was when we were kids i'm like nah it's it's not it's very different i think right now there's obviously some traditions that we've held on to that probably mm-hmm could go um but probably dating myself uh we used to get smacked all the time i don't think that's really been held on to right some <laughs> things of it i don't know yeah. i don't know if that, that maybe that's just a canadian thing but and it was and it was at a time where that was like that was like good teaching like my they would call home and say guess what we had to do to george and like what did he do <laughs> it wasn't like how dare you it was a very different time, right? So, I, like, I think there's, I know that's like a worst case scenario example, but we like so many things have progressed. So, I'm sure that you've seen this and you know, your 20 plus years uh, just being loaded. So, what are some of the things that you think of that have like changed significantly in the community? Ooh, it is, uh, yeah. I, and maybe I'm wrong, but I have this philosophy that we kind of have a pendulum in life, right? What one generation goes through they make adjustments to their parents and that kind of goes back and forth. Um, I think one of the changes I've seen is um, there was almost a blind trust of the public school system when I came in. And I think there is um, healthy and unhealthy skepticism. Are they really for my kid? Are they really? So I, I think It's harder because trust was almost, um, you know, it it was ingrained. You didn't have to work to build it. You you could mess it up, but it it was kind of there to begin with. Whereas now, and maybe this is the generation of parents who, you know, who are the kids that said, mom, why don't you ever believe me? You always believe the, you know, the principal. Um, And now we have a generation of parents who I think, okay, I, Trust has to be built and earned. So I think that's one thing that I'm seeing is different. Um, I mean, I, I also think the uh, invention of technology and the accessibility has changed minds to think differently. Mm-hmm. Um, and I see that in the attention span and the way in which kids are able to you know, focus on tasks. Um I mean, whether or not some of that's related to a pandemic or it's just been happening over time, I think that's a piece well uh, that that I'm seeing. I, I and and maybe this is a negative way to look at it, but I also um, I I do think um, th- those are some challenges I see. Um, I do. Th- I also see that kids come into school with such a wider array of um, foundational skills Mm -hmm. in school, um, which is fascinating to me. I think I I made some assumptions that kids understood what letters and numbers and sounds and, Mm -hmm. you know, and that that's clearly not the case. And I think it's a beautiful thing about public education is we get everyone, Mm -hmm. but it's also an aha as far as a starting point in the educational system. Um, I at least those are things that come to my mind right away. But I also, I believe, and I see this, I have great hope and I see the amazing young people and their hearts to care for others. And I think that is really awesome. It's not just this, I'm looking out for me and my future. I, you know, it's more socially connected in some ways, which is a really good thing. So I don't that comes to my mind when you, you know, in response. Yeah, I think kids have way more aware, like they have way more awareness of cultures and communities outside of their mm-hmm. own town, mm-hmm. right? Like I, there's stuff that kids know about places, you know, yeah. the, the analogy I always use is that you go off to summer camp and you say like, hey, we're going to be best friends forever. We're going to write each other. And then you would never talk again. Right. Now those same kids talk to each other all the time and they actually keep those friendships because they can have access in such an easy way. Like you, you, you know, I'm probably dating myself too, but you know, no, I hear- like long yeah. distance phone calls used to cost money. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, so right? you so would, it was uh, like limited, you hang up. So they have to call you back. So it 
cost them money and not you. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is dating. This this old yeah. tricks, the tricks of the trade there. So exactly. actually, I saw this. I saw this the other day. There was a there was like a phone. It was like, hey, this is like hands free, and it was like the this phone, <laughs> but yep. it actually you it, you put it into a device like into like headphones, mm-hmm. so you could just like headphone it a- across. And that was like the most portable. So you didn't have to like hold it to your head the entire time. There's an actual uh, commercial for that. I was like, I don't remember that, but <laughs> I yeah. guarantee you people were all over that back in the day. Yeah. I remember the the little puffy thing that you'd put on your shoulder so you could lean your head and talk <laughs> on the phone with that. that. But uh, yeah, uh, it's a, uh, it's a different world, but yeah, those are some of the changes. I mean, when you sit down one-on-one with a kid, yeah, you, you see the same qualities and you see the same you know it's like it's that scene from the movie hook when they finally take peter pan and he's like there you are peter and it's like this you know when you really get down to the one-on-one kids are really still you know amazing that that you know you just those connections happen in the same way um you know but in the bigger sense you know it's it does feel different than it was and and it's a, a unique time in education for sure. Yeah, and I, you know, and I think I think the good thing about education is that if anyone's going to evolve, it should be the organization that's focused on continuous learning, right? Like mm-hmm. that is that's who we are supposed to be. So I I right. try to continuously evolve uh, in the way I think as well, and and that includes you know when say like hey I used to think this now I changed my mind too, right? Mm-hmm. I think that that shows growth. All right, so this has kind of put me on the spot. Uh, I know that you were sending out this out not only to everyone that listens to this, but to your own district. So I'm coming there to speak to your staff. If that's a successful opening day, um, what does that look like for me? Like, how can I best serve your community? You know, I think we always need to focus on challenging the status quo. I really think um, we get entrenched in our patterns of thinking. I think we default to what we're comfortable with, Mm -hmm. but I think we as colleagues, as school sites, as individuals should always be asking ourselves questions. And the questions we should ask is, is this the best way to make the connections so that our kids can own that learning? So I I find that that is such a healthy conversation for us Mm -hmm. to just say that just because we've done it that way doesn't mean it's the best way to do it. And now let's spend some time thinking through our assumptions, our traditions, and challenge some of that to engage kids in different ways than we have. Um, So I, I hope coming out of that, that teachers are inspired to have those conversations and engage in the work of um, asking, is there a better way that we can make those connections? Is Are there assumptions that the, you know, prime example, is the best way to teach, to spend six weeks teaching every lesson? You know, I do, we do, you do. And then at the end, we give them a test, mm-hmm. which is really at the core is an assessment of how well we did our job. But the focus we give is, Oh, we're going to show you how poorly you did your job and ask the question, is this the best way to right. engage our kids? So I, and Ethan, initially at this point, um, that is definitely uh, important. And I, I think um, the start of a year is an opportunity for us to rega- uh, re-engage in the heart of why we do this job, right. because it can beat you down. And you can start worrying more about how many years I have till retirement and what do I have to do to get there, which right. is just a recipe for disaster, right? It's that it's that marathon focus on the, you know, the the pain. And instead of thinking, you know, what a what a unique opportunity we have to do this job that will last far beyond us and in ways that we never could have anticipated for for the next generation. So I, you know, you know, as you're saying this, there's probably no profession that can age you as quickly as teaching or to keep you as young as teaching, Yeah, but it is your perspective, right? Like the, 
if you let, I remember someone came to our district when I was teaching and I'll, they'll, I'll never forget this. And they, uh, they said it and I was like maybe third or fourth year. And they said, never let an eight year old ruin your day. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> I'm totally letting eight year olds ruin my day all the time. Cause I'm taking everything personally, everything's bugging me. And uh, you know, a lot of the issues that were kind of directed at me, weren't about me. They were about something that was happening outside of school, mm -hmm. but I was just a person they trusted. I was a person that they were close to. And then it was like, then I would get that moment. And it's like, oh, wait a minute, this isn't about me. And, and you know, it's still like, it's still not okay to, you know, talk like, you know, in an appropriate way to, you know, an adult or like, you know, be rude or anything like that. But it was, I was just, better able to deal with it because I thought that, but I always tell you, I, when you said that, I remember my second year teaching, I'm like 29 years old still. Yeah. <laughs> right. And I was, I was like totally checked out of it too. Like I was already like, Oh man. And, and now, you know, I just, I, I love, I, I know I'm not, I'm not in the classroom, not in schools anymore, but I love being part of education. I love working with schools. I love the enthusiasm. I always feel, more excited after I leave a district than when I entered because of the enthusiasm of teachers. So I, I can't wait to come there. I honestly can't, I, I'm excited to meet you too. Cause like, we just hit it off. So, um, well, I'll, I'll have both of my acoustic guitars ready for us. For a little piano. jam session. <laughs> a piano. So, Hey everyone, um, Neil, thanks so much for being on the podcast. I know Absolutely. you're super busy. Um, and I can't wait to join you on Lodi. So, um, Hopefully the, the Kings will make some trades by that time. And the Warriors. I don't care will, about the Kings. Well, the, oh, the Warriors will get Kevin Durant back. That's going to happen. I'm calling it right now. So like it's on, it's on, it's on video. So by the time I'll be there in July, Kevin Durant will be signed back with the Warriors and they're going to make another run. I'm just calling it right now. Yeah. We'll be stuck with that contract too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. I hope you have a wonderful day. Neil, thanks for being on the podcast. Yeah. Thanks. My pleasure. Thank you.